Lord. So their intention was good. The problem with good intentions is over the years, other generations arise. And these other generations tend to grab a hold of these teachings and then they turn them into concrete in that they begin to say, this is the word of the Lord. Like with Israel, by the time Jesus arrived, there was this set of teaching called the tradition of the elders. The tradition of the elders had been put on par with the word of the Lord. So they had two authorities when it came to the word of the Lord. You all stay with me. But the Sanhedrin council, the Jewish leaders had come to Jesus and they asked Jesus a question. They said, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? And they went through a list of different traditions of the elders that they held. And Jesus responded, he said about these individuals, he said, this people they draw near me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain, they do worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. This is a very interesting statement to be made by the master. The tradition of the elders, as we've been looking at, is a complete body of teaching that the religious leaders of Jesus's day over the years had developed. And we kind of went through this. So if you didn't catch part one, two, and three, uh, you, you definitely want to go back and listen to part one and part two of the series on the tradition of the elders. But they had developed an entire set of teachings surrounding the word of the Lord, which was not the word of the Lord, but it was rather the religious interpretations of what the scripture said. Actually, what they did is they built fence laws or hedge laws around the word of the Lord to prevent the people of Israel from transgressing the word of the Lord. So their intention was good. The problem with good intentions is over the years, other generations arise. And these other generations tend to grab a hold of these teachings and then they turn them into concrete in that they begin to say, this is the word of the Lord. Like with Israel, by the time Jesus arrived, there was this set of teaching called the tradition of the elders. The tradition of the elders had been put on par with the word of the Lord. So they had two authorities when it came to the word of the Lord. You all stay with me because you may be wondering what does that have to do with what you're going to deal with tonight. It has everything to do during the course of Jesus's ministry, Jesus did not run into conflict. Please hear what I'm going to say. Jesus did not run into conflict over the laws of God. Jesus did not run into conflict over the commandments of God. Jesus did not run into conflict with what the prophets had said. Jesus ran into conflict over what the religious leaders said, the word of the Lord taught. And because these teachings had been passed on, this is why they're called tradition, because 
successive generations of leaders embraced these teachings, they led the people to believe that these teachings were actually from God. This will help you when you read your New Testament. We're going to look at a couple instances of this because this same exact thing is taking place within the body of Christ today. Um, There are many people who consider themselves to be, I'm going to use some of the terms, they consider themselves to be theologians. They consider themselves to be apologeticists. They consider themselves to be defending the faith. They consider themselves to be pointing out heresy. And we're going to get into, we're going to get into quite a bit of this. They consider themselves to be watchmen on the wall. They consider themselves to be doing a lot of things. And in the process, what they are actually doing is they're really doing a lot of character assassination. So we want to look at this inquisition. We want to understand, number one, how this impacted the ministry of Jesus. Number two, what happened within church history regarding the Inquisition? And then number three, how this same spirit is rampant within social media. I was talking with a sister the other day, and we were talking about some of the quote unquote uh, apologeticists and theologians who (laughs) are very active on, let's say they're very active on YouTube. And they are literally obsessed with attacking certain people based on their belief because they don't hold to certain uh, traditions that have been embraced within Western Christianity. And so they are accusing a lot of people of being heretics. Now, this happens in every generation. So let me let me say this before I go, before we start diving into scripture. I have been in ministry now a little over 40 years. I've pastored a number of churches. Um, I went through my uh, seminary education, which let me know that theology doesn't necessarily teach Bible. Theology teaches certain traditions, certain practices, certain belief systems that people derive out of the scriptures. I love theology, but theology does not bring you into a knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Theology does not really give you an understanding of scripture. And this is why a lot of times when you're listening to people and they're debating theology, it's very philosophical, okay? A lot of it is based off of uh, Greek intellectualism. A lot of it is based off of reason. A lot of it is based off of logic. But because these things have been present within the body of Christ over, let's say, a couple hundred years, people believe that this is what the scriptures teach. And so they begin to make statements about certain things. And they say, well, this particular understanding was termed heresy years ago. And I asked the question, well, it was termed heresy by who? <laughs> now, y'all stay with me for a minute. It was termed heresy by who? What group, what body, what council deemed these particular views to be heretical? Because what was being viewed as heresy were any teachings that deviated from what the established institutional church received 
and called orthodoxy. Now, if you know anything about history, whoever wins the war gets to write the story. So because uh, the institutional church through persecution gained prominence, many people believe that what they teach and what they derived at through their councils is what's termed orthodoxy. And it's not. This is, this is the same challenge that Jesus found himself engaged in. Because let's remember, the religious leaders of Jesus's day accused Jesus of being a heretic. Because of Jesus's relationship with the Father, because God was manifested in Christ, because God dwelt in Jesus. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. And because people couldn't fit that understanding into their limited frame of reference, they accused Jesus and the disciples of being heretics. This is why they crucified him. We're seeing the same thing happening today in the body of Christ, and it seems to be going unnoticed. Many people don't seem to understand the spirit that is behind it. It's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the accuser of the brethren. So anyone who attacks, listen to me now, anyone who attacks individuals, I'm not talking about their teaching, I'm talking about their character, I'm talking about the behavior, I'm talking about their lifestyle because of a difference in view. Well, there's some question about what spirit is actually motivating these people. You see, we should be able, as people of God, to actually sit down and have a conversation over doctrinal positions. But it's difficult to do that because many of the people who, 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 who offer people to have conversation, they don't really want to have a conversation. They want to have what they call a debate. And what is going to happen in the debate is I'm going to prove my point so people know I'm right. Now, the motivation could have begun correctly, just like what happened with the leaders in Jesus' day, right? It could have begun you know, with good intention. But the problem that happens with good intention, as I said, is future generations come along. And this is what I'm seeing. Future generations come along and, and, and they don't really understand how mm, God has protected his word over the years. They don't really understand how God has always had a people who held on to the truth, that truth in and of itself can be its own defense. So when you're trying to have a conversation, things deviate away from the scripture. And it, as I said, it people start getting into logic, People start getting into reason. People start getting into something that they read in somebody's book about something. And it doesn't seem to be an open and honest heart that is being brought to the table. And so things become a flesh fest. I've watched some of them. They're literally flesh fest. You might as well, you might as well be watching Big Brother. Or, or, or one of the TV reality shows. This is like a Christian reality shows is what it is. And so everybody starts bashing everybody. Truth can stand on its own. So let's take a look at, at uh, a couple of things in scripture. Let's see how Jesus dealt with this inquisition. Because once you can identify that what's going on is not actually an honest dialogue. It's actually an inquisition. You'll know how to handle the inquisitors. All right, so let's take a look at this. 
in the gospel of Matthew chapter 12. That's where we want to start, Matthew chapter 12. And we're going to look at some scripture. In Matthew chapter 12, and I'm, I'm going to try not to hold y'all all night. I get a little long with it. If you don't believe me, ask some of the folks in the... <laughs> In our school of discipleship. But in Matthew chapter 12, this is what we read. And I'm going to start reading at verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees, this is the Sanhedrin. And we looked at the development of this group of folk, the Sanhedrin. They answered and they said to Jesus, we would see a sign from you. Now, I'm going to deal with a couple of things as we go. Jesus answered and said this, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there will no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So here come the religious leaders. Jesus is out ministering. Jesus is out doing what he does. Acts 10 38, Peter tells us how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with them. This is the simple this is the, if you if you wanted to sum up the ministry of Jesus, that would be what it is. Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. The religious leaders saw this and they said, "Master, we would see a sign. Show us a sign. Show us something that demonstrates that you are actually Messiah who was promised. Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And there's not any sign that's going to be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was three nights in the whale's belly, even so the son of man shall be three nights in the belly, in the heart of the earth. So he's talking about his death, his burial, his resurrection. That, beloved, is the fundamentals of the gospel. Now, let me make a statement. The fundamentals of the gospel is not signs, wonders, and miracles. I believe in signs, wonders, and miracles, but there is no gospel of signs, wonders, and miracles. I understand there are people who are preaching that that everything is about a miracle. Everything's about a healing. Everything's about a deliverance. And, you know, I cast out demons and I do this and, and we speak in tongues or we don't speak in tongues or we don't believe in miracles. We, we get into all of these squabbles and in the process, Jesus gets lost in the midst. The, the gospel is not about who speaks in tongues or who casts out demons because many of the people talking about casting out devils. Many of the people do not realize much of what they're teaching and preaching that's supposed to be demonology is really nothing more than middle age superstition. This is the same teachings that the Catholic Church, Pope, the, you know, the, the Pope and Romanism and all of that, the Greek, the Greeks, the Romans, right? <laughs> this is the same stuff that they use to keep the people of God in bondage in their day. Well, that has resurfaced. And this is why there are so many believers running around talking about spiritual warfare. You know, you would think the gospel is all about casting out the devil. Listen, folk, as we talked about a couple of nights ago, the devil doesn't have that kind of power. Jesus defeated the devil. You don't have to you don't have to wrestle and tussle with demons and devils. All you have to do is what the scripture tells us to do, and that is to submit yourself unto God, which is your reasonable service, resist the devil and he'll flee. But you would be led to believe that the devil just got everybody. 
And this is coming from so-called, you know, spirit-filled folks in the body. So let me say this before anybody, you know, wonders where I'm coming from. Full transparency. I'm born again. I'm spirit-filled. I believe uh, in the manifestation of tongues. I have a prayer language. All right. But tongues is not the gospel. <laughs> tongues is not the gospel. Neither is casting out devils. So a lot of people running around, y'all know who they are, but a lot of people running around trying to say that the fact that they cast out devils is proof that they're anointed. First of all, the Holy Ghost does not come to confirm a man's ministry. The Holy Spirit comes to confirm the word. They went forth, John tells us, or Mark, they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So when you find people who are trying to use what they're doing and saying, well, God's confirming my ministry because I cast out devils. Listen, folk, Jesus said many people were going to come to him in that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we feed the hungry in your name? Didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do the other thing in your name? And Jesus said, he will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So because someone says they're casting out demons does not mean that they have a relationship with Jesus. Oh, we're going to barrel down into some stuff tonight. So they came to Jesus. Jesus said, the only sign that's going to be given is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, in Matthew chapter 22, I hope this text is big enough. It seems to have come up a little smaller. I had a little bit of tech uh, issues today, but let's see what we can do here. In Matthew chapter 22, I'm going to read it. Matthew chapter 22, and we'll start at verse 23. Now watch this. The same day Jesus was out ministering, and it says the same day came to him <laughs> the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. Now I'm going to I'm going to make some statements. There is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brethren. Now, there were with us seven men. See, this is the reasoning and the logic of religious leaders. Hear me they start going into reason and logic over what the word of the Lord said. And they're presenting scripture to Jesus, not to get any kind of clear understanding. They're presenting scripture to Jesus, not because they want to know, not because they want to ensure that they're teaching the people the right thing. They're presenting scripture to Jesus because they're going to interrogate Jesus over his position of the scriptures. Are you with me? See, this is what, this, this is what these folks do. They'll present scripture not to really get any clarity. They're presenting scripture to enter into a debate, to find some kind of reason to reject the truth of the word of God so they can hold their tradition. This is what Jesus explained to him in Matthew. He said, you, you reject the commandment of God so you can hold on to your tradition. Jesus understood what was going on with these folk. Now, here come the, the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection. So these folks, this group, these were the modernness. These are the people who want to take the supernatural out of the gospel. They want to take the spiritual dynamic out of the gospel and make the gospel nothing more than propositional statements of truth. Folk, I hear it all the time. They're, they're, they're fighting over propositional truth. 
the faith of Jesus isn't an agreement to propositional truth. The faith of Jesus is entering into a relationship with the true and the living God who by the Holy Spirit will then open our understanding to the biblical story and give us sound teaching. This is what it is. But there are some people who obviously believe that they're saved by believing the right thing, because that's what tradition does. So you got to believe what we believe or you ain't saved. Sadducees, they didn't believe in no, no resurrection. So they said, well, 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 you know, Jesus, Moses said, then they're going to try to use scripture. So they said, well, <laughs> There were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he married a wife, he, he, he died, and, and he didn't have any offspring, so he left his wife to his brother. And then likewise, the second also, and, and then the third unto the seventh, and, and last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, which they did not believe in, so they're going to try to use philosophical thought and reason to justify why they do not believe what the scriptures say, but they rather hold to their tradition. We don't believe that there's a resurrection. We know that this is what Moses said, but think about this, Jesus. Just, just, just process this information. See, Jesus, if you really understood the Hebrew, if you really understood uh, what the, the authors in, that were writing if you really understood the, the culture of their day, if you really understood how to properly do exegesis, if you properly understood principles of, of hermeneutics, if you actually understood all of this, then you would know that what Moses said goes contrary to what you're teaching about the resurrection. Folk, this is how you can identify people who are taking you or attempting to take you through an interrogation. They don't believe it. And no matter what scriptural, uh, 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 no, no matter how clear you can make the scripture, folk, they can't see it. Their traditions have blinded their eyes. So why get into a flesh fest with these folks? They're the blind leaders of the blind, so let the blind lead the blind. I know they think that they smart, but they're not. All right, here we go. So notice Jesus' response. Jesus answered and said unto them, okay, you do ear. You are mistaken. Not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. So they're coming to Jesus with this religious argument, and Jesus just looked at them and said, look, you, you're mistaken. You're in, you, you, you do ear. Number one, you don't know the scriptures. Now people say, well, wait, but they're quoting from Moses. Folk, because people quote from the Bible does not mean they know the scriptures. I've heard people have conversations and they can pull a scripture about everything. They can pull a scripture about integrity. They can pull a scripture uh, about marriage. They can pull a scripture, you know, about uh you know, this is what a lot of the once saved, always saved debate is about. You know, they can pull all of these scriptures. So they can quote the scripture just like the Sadducees. But Jesus said, you're mistaken. You don't know the scriptures, nor do you know the power of God. So since you don't know the scripture and you don't know the power of God, how do you think you're going to understand something about the resurrection that takes the power of God to accomplish? You understand what I'm saying? But this is, this is the stuff Jesus had to deal with. This is stuff Jesus actually dealt with. 
So when we start talking about the Sanhedrin, when we start talking about the, the scribes and the Pharisees, see, we need to understand, it helps to understand where they were coming from. It helps to understand, you know, what is this Sanhedrin? What, what are these teachings that they're talking about? Because we just start reading stuff and then we start accusing people of being Pharisees and Sadducees. And we, you know, it, it could be that we are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Think about that for a minute. We're accusing people of being Pharisees and Sadducees when it is possible we are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. <laughs> so this is the one case Jesus said, you do ear, not knowing the scripture, nor do you know the power of God. Isn't that amazing? Hmm. So it goes down a little bit. Verse 34, we're still in Matthew chapter 22. And it says this. Well, let me, let me go back. In the resurrection, Jesus says, they neither marry nor are they given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken unto you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead. Y'all are asking me about a situation with a bunch of dead folk and you don't believe in the resurrection. But, but let me explain that what God is interested in, what Jesus is interested in, what, what Yahweh is interested in is bringing life to people. That's what he's interested in. These folks are dealing with things. Number one, they don't believe in the power of God to raise the dead. So they want to get philosophical about why something dealing with the resurrection is not even possible because that's what logic does. Christianity is not logic. It's truth. And it's a living word. Are you with me? He said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So when the multitude heard this, now listen, they were astonished at his teaching. See, the multitude loved the teaching of Jesus. The multitude could relate to the ministry of Jesus. Why is that? Because Jesus could relate to the multitude. Jesus didn't come up and present himself as some great, deep, philosophical theologian talking a bunch of stuff that the average person has no idea what you're talking about anyway. But because you present yourself in a certain way, they attribute authority to, to, to individuals because these individuals present themselves as authorities in their respective fields. Are you listening? Most people, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to get into that. Let me keep going. Let me, let me keep going. Verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. See, this is, this is something that's going to begin to take place and is going to begin to manifest. And I don't believe it's going to be that far into the future. You say, well, what is that, Daryl? What, what, what is that? I believe that we are going to begin to start seeing some of these folks' mouths silenced because they're talking about stuff. They have no idea what they're talking about. Then they engage with people who for whatever reason, don't seem to be able to give an answer for the hope that is within them. And then they say, well, see, these people. <laughs> Let me give you an example. One of the big hot topic debates right now on YouTube is, is the thing about the Trinity versus oneness. So you have all, 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 you know, all of these folk running around, you know, trying to prove the Trinity. And they make the statement and they make the accusation 
that people who are oneness, then they like to make it seem like they really know what they're talking about. Because they say, well, modalism. I know all about modalism. No, you obviously don't know about modalism based off of the statement that you make about modalism. <laughs> but but if people, if people haven't done their due diligence and really looked at this stuff, you know, no, what they're saying is the school that they went to was Trinitarian. And they were indoctrinated into Trinitarianism. And so anyone who doesn't believe Trinitarianism is a heretic. This is an inquisition. This is not the first time this happened. The first time this happened, you have to go back and you have to look at the third and fourth century of church history when they begin to develop these councils, when they had the Council of Nicaea, when they had the Council of Chalcedon, when they had the Council of Ephesus, when, uh, when they had the Council of Trent, all of these various councils that were held. And what you will begin to discover is for the first two to 300 years of the faith, the Trinity was unheard of, even among Origen, even among Ignatius, even among Athanasius. People say, well, who are these people? These are the people that people consider to be the church fathers. The apostles were the church fathers. These are post-apostolic leaders. And most of them, though they sound like they believe in the Trinity, did not hold to an understanding of the Trinity the way it is held today. <laughs> right? Now, I'm not saying what side I, I come down on at this point. I'm just simply stating that these are the facts. So you have people who are just simply parroting their tradition. And if you just simply want to go into the word and find out what the scriptures actually teach about the nature of God, those conversations start going all, all over the place because people start getting into things scripture doesn't even deal with. You know, the, and this is where they start getting into all of the Greek terms, uh, the homo the homoecious, you know, uh, well, he's of the same essence. He's of the same substance. He's of the same this. Do, do you believe that Jesus existed before the incarnation? See, it starts getting into a lot of that. And the truth of the matter is the scriptures don't even deal with it. Then they go to John 1.1. 1, 1. Well, what about the Logos? What about the Logos? Do you understand that when John was writing and John used that reference to the Logos, he is actually writing it as a defense of the faith, combating other views, primarily Gnostic views, who also use the idea of the Logos. Because Plato was the first one to start dealing with this notion of the Logos. And John is simply stating that this Logos that y'all talking about, this is God. But later generations came along and they built a whole theology around the Logos. Origen believed that at some point in time, in the way distant past, God begot the Logos, who is the son, the second person of the Godhead. That was at some point in time. Well, if it was some point in time and eternity past that the father begot the Logos, then he can't be co-eternal. But that's another message. OK, that, 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 that's a whole other conversation. I'm just saying this is the kind of conversations that start going on in the body as opposed to just simply understanding, look. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the man Christ Jesus, 
who was God manifested in the flesh. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with them. What the gospel is focused on is the fact that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the issue of the gospel is salvation. The issue of the gospel is not people's philosophical mumbo jumbo. And that's a lot of what it is. It's philosophical, theological mumbo jumbo. And I am theologically educated. So I'm not knocking that. However, I had an understanding of the scripture before I even went to seminary. A lot of people get their understanding from the scriptures of the scriptures from seminary. They're indoctrinated and they're following the tradition of the elders. Okay, moving right along. So <laughs> when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked them a question, tempting him. See, they always came to Jesus with questions, not to really get answers. They came to Jesus, not really to get understanding. It's not like they were all functioning with the same type of heart that Nicodemus had. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Nicodemus was a teacher of teachers. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said, Master, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No man can do the miracles that you do except God be with them. And Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. So Jesus recognized in Nicodemus a heart that was searching after truth. Many people don't have a heart that's searching after truth. Many people have a heart that just simply wants to prove their position. That is what the Inquisition was about. This is what the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers, the teachers of the law, the tradition of the elders law, this is what motivated them. They want to tempt them. <laughs> but watch what they were tempting them on. Well, Master, uh, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said, oh, the great commandment, uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the first and the great commandment. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Are you listening? What's the great commandment? And he quotes the second part of the Shema. You know what the Shema is, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What? Love for God, love for your neighbor. <laughs> that sums it all up. Love for God, love for your neighbor. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, you're not going to transgress the first four commandments. Why? Because the first four commandments deal with man's relationship to his creator. The first four. The last six deal with man's relationship to man. It's all about the love that God revealed when he gave Israel 
the 10 words. We call them the 10 commandments. So if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your, your, your soul and your strength, you're not going to have other gods before him. You're not going to make idols to, you know, about him. You know, you're not going to break Sabbath. There's certain things you're not going to do. Why? Because you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you're not going to have any gods before that God that created the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. You're not going to commit adultery. You're not going to bear false witness. You're not going to covet your neighbor's wife. You're not going to covet your neighbor's property. You're not going to do what the last six say you shall not. Why? Because your relationship with humanity is governed by love. Do you see how simple this actually is? But Jesus comes in and he has to confront all of this religious tradition. He has to confront all of these traditions that have been built up in the mind of Israel by their religious leaders and pawned off on the people as if this is from God. Folk, it's no different today. There's so much tradition that has been received as the word of the Lord and then pawned off on people, especially in America, pawned off on people as the word of the Lord. This is orthodoxy. Well, a lot of orthodoxy isn't really orthodoxy. It's tradition. All right, let me keep going. I know I'm getting myself in trouble, but I'm okay with that. So that, that was Jesus. So in verse 46, it says this. No man was able to answer him a word. Neither did any man from that day forth ask him any more question. See, the time comes where you just have to silence the mouth of the, in, of the inquisitioners, those who are coming to attack the faith of the gospel because the faith of the gospel contradicts their traditions. And the thing that amazes me is a younger generation that's doing this today. But that always happens because this stuff resurfaces in every generation. Younger generation. Okay. Moving right along. So let's move a little further and let's, let's look at what happened with the apostles. The real church fathers. <laughs> let's, let's look at the experience. So let's look at Acts chapter four, and I'm going to read verses one through three. And as they spoke, this is, this is, it's after Peter preached, Peter healed this man that was crippled. Y'all remember that, don't you? Acts chapter three, Peter healed the man. And then when they asked Peter how he did it, he said it was his name, verse Acts chapter three, verse 16. Let me set this up. It was his name. It was whose name? It was his name and faith in his name. Well, whose name? When Peter and John looked at the man, they said, silver and gold we don't have, but such as we have give we unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. See, the name of Jesus has power, despite what some of the modern day Sanhedrin want to tell you, because the modern day Sanhedrin just simply want to tell you as they go through their Greek, well, that just really means under the authority of. No, they used the name. There's power in the name. There's no magic in the name, but there's power in the name. There's authority in the name because of whose name it is. Jesus means Yah has become salvation. Yahweh has become salvation. It's a compound name. 
Jesus inherited, Hebrews tells us, he inherited a name, which is far greater. He has received the name above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's power in the name, despite the fact, as I said, these folks are so smart that they will explain away the power and the authority that is in the name of Jesus. Why? Because they're, they would rather hold their tradition than receive the truth of the word of God. I've been there. I mean, I've, I've been wrong. I'll be wrong again. I don't claim to be the all-knowing one. I don't claim to be the great theologian. I don't claim any of that. I claim to be a child of God who is hungry after truth, who has been given by Jesus a ministry to feed, to edify, to build up his body, as well as reach the laws with the gospel of the kingdom of God. That's what I claim to be. So all I have is what God has given me in the word. Okay. He said, it's his name and it's faith in his name that has made this man strong, who you see and know. Yeah, the faith which is by him. I'm reading Acts chapter three. Verse 16, the faith that is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. I don't know why people don't believe in the present day operation of the power of God. I don't get it. I don't understand that people don't believe that as children of God, as followers of Jesus, we do not have power and authority over the work of the enemy. I don't know why. People don't believe that Jesus defeated the devil. I don't understand why the death, they don't believe the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and glorification of Jesus was enough for God to give people the gift of the Holy Ghost, which according to Peter, again, is the promise of the father. I don't know why people deny that other than the fact that they have been indoctrinated with a religious tradition that says God doesn't do that anymore. He stopped doing it when we got the Bible. It's a lie straight out of the pits of hell. Jesus said, I am the Lord and I change not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he healed then, he'll heal now. If he delivered then, he'll deliver now. If he saved then, he'll save now. We serve a risen Savior. Folks, Jesus isn't locked up in somebody's systematic theology. This, this is all I'm trying to say. Jesus is alive and well, I might add. So let's see where this got them. <laughs> verse, now we're at Acts chapter four. I'm almost done. As they spoke unto the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple, the church, the church, this the church leadership, <laughs> and the Sadducees. So the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. If you want to see religious factions come together, all you have to do is get a people who are walking in obedience to the commandment of the Lord Jesus. Just get some people who will just take God at his word. Just, just take a group of people who have accepted the call of God to follow Jesus. They've accepted the call to deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow Jesus. Find some people who, after having spent some time with Jesus and has had Jesus process them. See, this is this is part of the problem with, 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 with some folk. They've never been processed by God. They're still novices in the faith. And of course, Paul said not to put a novice in leadership, not a novice. 
because they'll be lifted up in pride and fall into the condemnation and snare of the devil. And this is what has happened. Folk have gone to two, three years of Bible college, and now all of a sudden they're a theologian, they're a scholar, they're an apologist, but they've never been processed by the Lord Jesus. See, Jesus sends people to preach. Jesus sends people to teach, not religious systems, not religious hierarchies, not Bible colleges, not Bible seminaries. These are all tools that the Father can use to develop us. But because we got a degree does not mean we understand the word of God. Because we can re- because we can read a strong exhaustive concordance and read and, and use Hebrew and Greek terms doesn't mean we understand the scriptures no more than it did for the leaders in Jesus's day. That's why Jesus could say, you do ear. You don't know the scripture nor the power of God. I know you can quote Bible. You just don't know the scriptures. You have no understanding of the scripture. You don't have any. The spirit of God has not opened the eyes of your understanding. Jesus has not opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. They've never had a Luke 24 experience. It says, then Jesus opened up their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. If Jesus doesn't open our understanding to the scriptures by the Holy Spirit, we're not going to understand the scripture. We can know as much theology, we can quote as much Bible, we can quote as much Greek, Hebrew, Latin, you name it. We can do all of that and not know the scriptures. All scriptures given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness so that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scripture is given by inspiration. Peter could go on and say that that prophecy never came by the will of man. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved, as they were borne along, as they were carried by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit inspired the writers of this text. It takes the same spirit to give us an understanding of what they wrote. That's why you cannot understand the scripture if the Holy Spirit doesn't give you an understanding. We think because we can spout some tradition and people think, oh, hey, a good teacher. And they just as, hmm. They're just as blind as the Pharisees and the and the Sadducees in Jesus' day. But let's go on. Acts 4, verse 1. As they spoke unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Now watch. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. See, Jesus had already brushed up against all of their tradition during his three and a half years of ministry. He had already revealed that they did not know what they were talking about. He had already demonstrated through his life, through his miracles, through his teaching, that the tradition of the elders, the body of belief that the people had received from the leaders, Jesus had already demonstrated there's nothing to it. Y'all stay with me. Now, Jesus has been crucified. He had revealed himself to to the 12. He has revealed himself additionally to the 500. The apostles now are out preaching the gospel. The disciples are out telling people about this resurrected Christ. Peter and John were going up to the temple. There was a man there from birth, about 40 years old. They knew the man, right? I'm talking about the leaders knew the man. And Peter and John healed the man and then preached to the people mm, mm, mm. (laughs) through Jesus, the resurrection of the dead. Now you would think that these folk would be happy. People are being delivered. People are being set free. People are being saved. Families are being restored. You would think that the religious leaders would be rejoicing. They weren't. Why? 
because they weren't one of them. They didn't go to their school. They didn't subscribe to their religious tradition. They they broke. In fact, you know, they were upset anyway with Jesus because his disciples broke the tradition of the elders. See, when you don't go along to get along with folks' tradition, the religious leaders aren't going to be happy. They're going to come out against you. They're going to go on a character assassination. That's what they're going to do. But it says they laid hold on them and then they put them in custody. They threw them in jail until the next day because it was now eventide. How be it? Many of them that heard the word believed and the number of men was about 5,000. Day of Pentecost, 4,000 heard the word and believed. Next day, Peter and John healed this man. 5,000 believed. Listen, folk, the gospel has power. I want y'all to hear me now. Now, I understand, and I need to say this. I understand that there are a lot of people running around claiming that they've been sent by God and they're walking in the power. But here's the thing about miracles. Miracles are undeniable. Now, people still may not believe it was God, but miracles are undeniable. You don't have to argue about a miracle. A miracle is undeniable. This is why they couldn't do anything with Peter and John because you had this man standing there who had been healed. How can you say that there's nothing to the message because there's the proof that the man has been healed? The, the challenge many of us face in Pentecostal charismatic apostolic circles is many people are claiming a bunch of miracles, but there's no verification that there's been miracles. See, God still does miracles. But we have a lot of people, they built their ministry, folks, off of miracles. During the 50s, during the 60s, during the 70s, you, we had men like A.A. A. Allen, and we had Jack Coe, and Oral Roberts, and Catherine Kuhlman, and, and all of these other individuals who crisscrossed the nation, and they had a miracle ministry. There is no such thing as a miracle ministry. Signs, wonders, and miracles confirm the word, the gospel. And the gospel is the gospel of Jesus. The gospel is the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, glorification, and second coming of the Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit confirms that message. But many people today in error are preaching a gospel of signs, wonders, and miracles. That's all they talk about, signs, wonders, and miracles, and demons being cast out. And I speak in tongues. whoopee doopy do. <laughs> you understand? Okay, you speak in tongues. Great. Paul said, I'm glad that I speak in tongues more than you all. But I had rather, in the church, I would rather say, Five words in a tongue and a language that people can understand than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. See, this is what you call out of balance teaching. This is misplaced emphasis. It doesn't do away with the blessing of a prayer language. It doesn't do away with that. But if we get it out of balance and we start telling people, you ain't saved unless you speak in the Holy Ghost. You ain't this if you don't talk in tongues. You ain't this. if It's out of balance. It's out of balance. Jesus is bringing balance back to the body. This is what this reformation and restoration is about that we are currently engaged in. Jesus is bringing balance back to the body of Christ on these things because a lot of this stuff has gotten way out of balance. It's gotten way out of balance. So where was I? All right. 
So what happens next? So they put Peter and John in prison. Now, let's look at verse 18 and see what happens. Let me get this up for you. Verse 18. So verse 13 says this. Now, hmm, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. See, here's the thing, folks. If people are doing miracles and the people that are receiving these healings are being put forth and these things are being verified, there's nothing you can do about it. And I've seen miracles. In, in, I've seen miracles, okay? I've seen the reports that people receive from the medical community confirming the miracle. Stay with me. Confirming the miracle. I've seen these things happen. But I'm also aware that far too often People are claiming miracles and healings and deliverances, and there is no proof. There is no verification. So it's suspect. Anybody can say certain things happened in my church this morning while I was preaching, and the Holy Ghost fell, and this person got delivered, and this person got a demon cast out, and this person had their eyes on. Well, where's the proof? Where's the verification? that this stuff is happening. Remember when I said everything God does can be verified, which is why the scripture says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be confirmed. Okay, let's see some evidence. All right, so now, they had been with Jesus. Beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. This is now an inquisition that is being launched not directly against Jesus. This is being launched against the followers of Jesus. They're doing the same thing to them that they did to Jesus. Listen, folk, if you're going to follow Jesus, you can expect the same response from the world that he did And Jesus got a pretty good response from the world, I might add. The multitude received the word. The multitude received. It was the religious order who had a problem with Jesus. And what the enemy has done, the enemy has given a lot of people a bunch of religious tradition that they're calling Christianity. They're calling Pentecostalism. They're calling the charismatic movement. And a lot of it is just simply resurfacing tradition from the past. And he's pawning that off on people. And folk, the world recognizes. Ain't nothing to that. It's gimmicks. It's hype. God is raising up his people in this hour. He's raising up his people. And those who he is raising up are going to have the same experience that Jesus had, that the apostles had, that the body of Christ has always had historically down through the years. This is not about lifestyles of the rich and famous ministries, folk. It's not about that. This is not about the commercialism. It's not about the popularity. It's not about the self-exaltation. It's not about any of that. This is about Jesus. This is about God preparing a people fit for the master's use, who will walk in power, who will walk in truth, who will be used by God in this time of restoration. They will be. Because God is preparing his people for the coming of the Lord. It's amazing how many people don't like to talk about the second coming. All these prophets don't want to talk about the second coming. Gnostics. 
Okay, let's keep going. So when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they'd been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed, now listen to this. What shall we do? Because indeed, a notable miracle has been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem and we can not deny it. Do you know what's going to silence the mouth of a lot of people who say God doesn't do miracles anymore? When notable miracles are manifested, when God demonstrates he still does miracles, that will put an end to any question about signs, wonders, and miracles. Folk, listen, us arguing our position is not going to convince anybody anything. Whether you are for or against isn't going to convince anybody if all you're presenting is a theological position. What do the scriptures say? What's the evidence from scripture? What's the evidence? from your teaching that lines up with the scripture and what does God confirm in terms of his word? God will always confirm his word. The word of the Lord will not return back to him without accomplishing the purpose for which it was sent. Does this make sense? Does this, does this make sense? I hope it does. I'm trying to close. Look, but verse 17, so that it doesn't spread any further among the people, let straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Do you see the, 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 the prominence of the name of Jesus? Do you see what the issue was in the early church with the apostles and with the religious systems of his day was the fact that the apostles and all of the, the followers of Jesus put this great emphasis on the name of Jesus. So everything that they did, they did it in the name of the Lord. When they went to preach, they preached in the name of the Lord. As they were going forth doing, uh, proclaiming the gospel and God was confirming the word with signs following and people were being healed in the name. Peter said in Acts 3, it's his name and faith in his name. See, what causes the enemy to get upset is when people begin to put emphasis on the name. Folk, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. Folk, listen, if people have a problem with the name of Jesus, they probably have a problem with the purpose of Jesus. They probably have a problem with the person of Jesus. Why would anybody have a problem identifying with the Lord who died for them, the Lord that was buried for them, the Lord that was raised for them. See, Paul said, don't you know that so many of us as were baptized, were baptized into his death? Therefore, being buried with him by baptism, you also risen with him in, in the faith of the operation of God that raised him from the dead. So why do people have a problem identifying with the name of Jesus in anything they do, whether they're preaching, whether they're witnessing, whether they're baptizing, whether people are being filled with the Holy Ghost, whether people are being saved. What's the problem that people have with the name of Jesus? It's that the name of Jesus smacks up against the tradition of men and people will rather hold their tradition just like they did in the book of Acts, just like they did 
in the Gospels, just like they did in the Old Testament, just like they did in the epistles of Peter, Paul, James, and John, just like they've always done down through the history of the church. The enemy hates the name of Jesus because of whose name it is. This is God manifested in the flesh. Y'all understand what I'm saying here? So, so why try to argue about the name? Just walk in the power of the name. Preach and teach the gospel by the authority of the name. That's what the apostles did. But they brought them up before the church council. You got to watch them church councils because them church councils will always try to twist the truth of the word of God. Always. Because they want to remain in control. All right. But so that it spread no further, verse 17, Acts 4, 17. So that it spread no further. So that it spread no further <laughs> among the people. Let's just threaten them and don't and tell them not to speak to no man in this name. Stop all this Jesus stuff. Stop going out here telling folk that Jesus can save them. Stop telling folk Jesus can heal them. Stop telling people that they can identify with Jesus in their baptism. Stop telling folk that stuff and just preach our theology. Just preach our nice cultural Christianity that tells people, well, you know, if you just believe everything we tell you, if you believe our systematic theology, if you believe our propositional truth, you'll be saved. No, you must be born again. You must be born again. So, so did it spread no further among the people. Verse 18, they commanded them, called them, and then commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach <laughs> in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, look, whether it be right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. But we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, because all the men glorified God for that which was done. Because the man was about 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. Are you listening? Are you listening? Stop preaching and teaching in that name. What did they tell Jesus? You're not of God. They went so far as to crucify Jesus. They said, you know, we're not crucifying you because of a good work. We're crucifying you because you, being a man, make yourself equal with God. Jesus, being a man, didn't make himself equal with God. God, being God, decided to become a man to redeem man. Are you listening? Jesus did not. Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, did not make himself God. God, who in the beginning said, let's make man in our image after our own likeness. God chose to become incarnate. That's the theological term. God decided to become one of us to redeem us from the fall of Adam. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. In Christ, Colossians tells us, dwells all of the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. Jesus said, listen, if you don't believe me because of my words, at least believe me because of the works. Because the works that I do, it's not me doing them. It's the Father that dwells in me. Come here, Mary. You're going to conceive in your womb and you're going to bring forth a son. That holy thing that shall be conceived in you shall be called, 
the Son of God. The Spirit of God came upon Mary and Christ was brought forth. <laughs> See, people are so busy running around trying to prove God the Son. <laughs> Jesus said, I am that I am. I am the son of God. I'm the son of God, but I'm also the son of man. I'm 100% God. I'm 100% man in one. I'm the God man. I am the man, Christ Jesus, in whom God dwelt. Y'all stay with me. Now, somebody's going to hear what I just said, and they're going to run off. Then they're going to start talking about I'm a false teacher because I teach that Jesus was born. Jesus was born. He was born of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> that holy thing. That holy thing that shall be born shall be called the son of God. That's what the scriptures say. But that's not what all of their religious philosophy and all of this other stuff that they've come up with over the centuries actually say. So they want to get into arguments about the preexistence of the son. The emphasis of scripture has nothing to do with the preexistence of the son. The emphasis of the scripture has to do with God becoming flesh. In fact, John goes so far. I'm going to say this and then I'm going to be done for tonight. John, the apostle John, goes so far as to say this. This is how, this is how you deal with your inquisitioners because we are experiencing a modern day inquisition. It's not the first time in history that it happened. This is a modern day inquisition though. This is a character assassination. This is being carried out by a bunch of people who do ear not knowing the scripture nor the power of God. What they know real well is the tradition of the elders. What they know real well is the systematic theology that has been passed down over the years and that same Systematic theology is what fueled the persecution of millions of Christians historically. That's what drove the Inquisition of the 13th, 14th, and 1500s. That's what caused the Inquisition because there were groups of people who rejected the traditions that the councils had come up with. And they decided to just go with Jesus. They were persecuted. They were hunted down. They were lynched. Their families were destroyed. They were burned at the stakes. Their books were burned. And then the institution that was responsible for doing it said, the reason we did it is because they were heretics, because they veered away from the tradition that we hold. Isn't that what the religious leaders in Jesus day did? It's the same exact thing. It's the same spirit. And it's the same spirit that's driving this modern day inquisition. All right. First John chapter four, and I'll be done. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try them. Test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Now understand, when John said, test the spirit, and I've heard this in Pentecostal circles for a long time. Now I'm hearing it coming out of the mouth of the, the watchers, the watchmen, <laughs> the, her the modern day heresy hunters. YouTube is full of them too. Modern day heresy hunters. But and I'm starting to hear the same thing come out of their mouth. Their discernment. Can't you discern their false prophet? 
And then people who, you know, they real they real spiritual, spirit filled folk, tongue talkers, right? And I've already said I I have a prayer language, right? But tongue talkers, and they say, well, I can discern in my spirit that this person don't have the Holy Ghost. Well, I can discern in my spirit. Therefore, do you realize that there's actually nowhere in the scriptures that says we are to discern a false prophet? Nowhere. Nowhere. Well, you know, I discern in my spirit that something's wrong with this person. Well, that's that's an operation of discernment. That is an operation of discernment. And we ought to have discernment. But when it comes to false prophets and false teachers, there's nowhere in the scripture that talks about discerning them. He said, test them, try them, prove them. And then he gives us the test. Say what? John said, believe not every spirit, but test, try, prove the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And that's true. There's a bunch of false prophets in the world today. There's a bunch of false apostles. There's a bunch of false teachers. But that doesn't mean that there's not true apostles, true prophets, true teachers. The only time you need to have a counterfeit is when there is a true. See, you have never seen a counterfeit or fake $7 bill before, have you? Why not? Because we don't use $7 bills. The only time you will see a counterfeit of something is it's a counterfeit of something that's genuine. So he said, beloved, believe not every spirit. Try the spirits, whether they are of God. Many false prophets are going out into the world. This is how you can know the spirit of God. Now, here we go. Here's the test. Every spirit, listen, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ, now, this is Jesus of Nazareth, who had been born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified. And then raised from the dead. This Jesus who had been proclaimed Christ, the Messiah. Jesus himself said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach. Luke chapter four, you all know the story. Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth is in fact Messiah. He is in fact the Christ. Now, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is come in the flesh. This is dealing with the humanity of Christ as well as the deity of Christ. Are you listening? This deals with the humanity of Christ as well as the deity of Christ. Because there were people who were teaching that this Jesus, he only appeared to be human. He wasn't really human because God can't become a man. And they went off into all of their philosophy. <laughs> it was a bunch of philosophy going around in those times. But they went into all of their philosophy, all of their reasoning, all of their pagan understanding of God. And they said, well, this Jesus of Nazareth, this, this really can't be God manifested in the flesh. He couldn't be a real man. God couldn't really become a part of creation. Well, see, they forgot they're dealing with God. God does what he wants to do. <laughs> okay. But anyway, I don't want to get off into that. But every spirit. So they're denying the incarnation. They're denying that Jesus Christ really came in the flesh, that he was a real flesh and blood human. See, Jesus was tempted 
in all points like as we are yet without sin. He was tempted, yet he remained without sin because he kept his will in submission to the will of the Father that dwelt in him so that he did not transgress the commandment of God in the same way the first man, Adam, had transgressed. So if, if, if we can deny the reality of the incarnation, if we can deny the reality of the full humanity of Christ, if we can deny the reality of the deity of Christ. Now, we may not understand it. And this is what trips people up. I can't understand how God did this. I have to accept this by faith. My brain ain't smart enough to figure out God. I, 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 I mean, I'm sorry. You know, I mean, I'm not smart as some of these people. <laughs> I'm not theologically as educated as some folks, I guess, because I acknowledge that in my humanity, the only thing I can understand about the Father is what he reveals to me from his word. Are you, are you with me? All right. So every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. That's the test. This isn't about discernment. This is a test. What do these people say? about God manifested in the flesh. What do these people say about the, the biblical testimony of the redemptive work of God? What do these people say? That's the test. So this is how we can know the spirit of God, if that's what they confess. And the word confess means to speak in agreement what? With, with what the scriptures say. So, if my preaching and if my teaching does not line up with the text, I'm not talking about our tradition. I'm talking about the text. But but there are people who don't believe you can actually just have a heart after God and you can pick up your scriptures and you can ask the Father to open the eyes of your understanding to what's written. Many people don't believe you can do that. You got to know all of the intricacies of, you know, all of the religious stuff to understand the scriptures. Okay. So he says, every spirit that doesn't confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is about the incarnation. You, you all understand what I'm saying? The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. The first man, Adam, was of the earth. The second man, note, is the Lord from heaven. We're talking about two men. <laughs> I'm not denying the deity of Christ. I'm acknowledging he's fully human. But I'm saying God, who is fully human, took on himself and incarnated himself into flesh so that he could be a faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God. We do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. God knows what it means to be human. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Now the religious orders, they don't like that. They don't like that because they want to keep God out there so far away because that's the God that they have in their mind. It's a mythological God. And a lot of that came out of a, a, a lot of our middle age theology. It's a God who is out there. This, this God who, who just, you know, God was manifested in the flesh. We know exactly what God is like because he manifested himself in the person of the Lord Jesus. That's why John can say that which we have seen, that which we have handled, that which we have touched of the word of life. For the life 
was manifested. Where? In the person of the Lord Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. This, okay. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come to flesh is not of God. This is that spirit of the Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. I submit to you that many people are preaching a coming Antichrist, and I submit to you that as in John's day, there were already men, many Antichrists. There are Antichrists in the world today. Their whole, their, their whole system of theology has been warped. Their system of eschatology, it's been warped. Their system of soteriology, that's the doctrines of salvation, has been warped. The, the, their, their understanding of pneumatology, that's the study of the things of the spirit, it's been warped. Their ecclesiology, that has to do with our understanding of the, the, the church. They still think the church is an institution. The church is the people. We are the body of Christ. Their ecclesiology is off. Their demonology is off. They do ear, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. The new inquisition. You can always identify that spirit, no matter who is operating it. And I've seen that spirit operating in multiple people, <laughs> especially on Facebook, operating or YouTube, I should say, operating in multiple people, calling themselves defending the faith. And it's the same spirit of the Antichrist, who wants to attack and go after those who are lifting up the name of the Lord Jesus. And you can always identify them. I've given them, my gosh, I've given you some scriptures just to look at, to see what was Jesus dealing with. How do these accusers come? What what is the nature of how they're using scripture? Because everybody that came to Jesus to confront Jesus about his Messiahship, all of the Sanhedrin, all of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers, teachers of the law, they all used the scriptures. They all took scripture, twisted scripture that they didn't understand and then presented to Jesus to ask him, well, what do you have to say about this? What do you say about John 1, 1? What do you say about this? What do you say? It's the same spirit. So folks, I just want to encourage you. If you have a heart, if you have a heart to know truth, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed in truth and you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Didn't say truth going to set you free. The truth will make you free because many people are so bound by religious tradition and they don't even know that's what they're dealing with. Many people. Oh, but God has some servants. God has some servants who are going to obey him. They're going to walk in his word. They're going to preach in his name. They're going to baptize in his name. They're going to evangelize in his name because there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And anybody who wants to argue that point, that's clear evidence. That's clear evidence that they're not operating at that point in the Holy Spirit. I didn't say they did not say. I didn't say that. What I'm saying is at that point with what they're doing, they're not operating in the Holy Spirit they're actually operating in an antichrist spirit who wants to demean and pull down the glory of the Lord Jesus. They don't want people 
operating in that name. That's the new inquisition. And it's alive and well. And it is a precursor. Listen, it is a precursor of things which will shortly come to pass relative to the body of Christ that is living during this time of the end. Amen and amen. I